All right, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to talk about the eternal purpose, uh, not just the purpose, but an eternal purpose. And that's, that's a really, the extra word really means a lot. Because if you just said purpose, sometimes we have a purpose and then uh, we do it or it goes away or whatever. But there's going to be the word, the terminology, eternal purpose. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. Look in verse 1, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, we have observed this before. We know where Paul is. We know why he is where he is. And he's writing some great knowledge to the Ephesian group. And he went to Ephesus in Acts 19 or earlier, maybe. But when he went to Ephesus, he knew people there, and he knew the elders. And uh, the elders, in, in reference to the scriptures associated, that's where the bishops came from, the bishops that oversaw the money for the, the saints at Jerusalem. And we use the word starving saints, but it's just the saints at Jerusalem who were getting probably low on funds and stuff. And so the funds were being supplied by the... Uh, Gentiles which believed but he said if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you or so he's not sure whether they have or not because of the word if if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you or so the dispensation of the grace of God is given to the people he's writing to and the people he's writing to are the probably you in the pronoun usage of chapter one and two. But now let's read on. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, the mystery of chapter one and two, especially chapter two, is what he wrote. And he had already wrote by far long before this, the gospel of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, and the, the mystery of 1 Corinthians 2, 5 through 8. So this mystery that he wrote in Ephesians uh, is a mystery that was given to him. And he was basically put in prison because of this knowledge. Um, the first thing that happened to Paul when he got saved or received the salvation of the Lord he was separated, and immediately the, the God of this world, Satan, went after him and with a full-bore challenge to get rid of him. <clears throat> and, of course, they stoned him in Acts 14, 15, in that area. But he came back, and I, I personally, by the scriptures, believe that he had revealed to him uh, some things that were unlawful to be uttered at that time. And that's Second Corinthians chapter 12, if you look at it very closely. But <clears throat> the devil persecutes him continuously, but he does his missionary journeys, his journeys where he goes to different areas and, and basically goes to houses and teaches and he goes into the synagogue, but then he's removed and in a sense, they don't want to hear it no more. So he turns to Gentiles that are outside of the synagogues and whatever. And each town he goes to, he goes to a Jew first because they had the oracles. And he explains this in Romans 3, 1 and, and, uh, and Romans 10 and Romans 11. But <clears throat> when his missionary journeys are done, he even states he'd like to go again. But something happens to where he's totally imprisoned, put in prison. And being put in prison... He's going to write, and again, this is my personal observance of the scripture, but you have to make up your own mind. He writes down what he saw and heard. And when I say saw, I'm talking about it with his mind's eye. He saw her, what he heard, he saw and wrote it down, which was when he was called up to third heaven. And the reason I say that, the Ephesian and Colossian letter are not prophecy. Uh, 
they have nothing to do with prophecy. They're pure grace, and uh, and it's the it's God giving knowledge of what would be coming in the ages to come in a sense of time. And Paul at one time thought he'd go out alive. Then later on, he knew he wasn't going to go out alive. His time of departure was at hand. And he turned the ministry over to Timothy. And he told Timothy what to do in First and Second Timothy and Titus. And <clears throat> I don't think a lot of preachers are observing that. Uh, Paul told Timothy to consider what he said, and the Lord gave him understanding of all things, understanding of what he said. I mean, why take it out of context? Consider what I say, and the Lord gave the understanding uh, and all things, and, and considering Paul. There's some things in Paul's writings that are hard to understand if you try to wad it all together up with just one vision or one understanding. It No, it, it has many facets of understanding. It has many uh, things were involved in the visions given to him. But in verse 3, Ephesians 3.3, 3, how that by revelation, not prophecy, how that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, not the mystery of Christ, my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ is that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to Scripture. First Corinthians 2 said that had the principalities of power known this, they would not have crucified the Lord's glory. If they had known the power that was involved in the crucifixion and resurrection, they wouldn't have done it. But here now is a mystery that's in the mystery of Christ. It's a knowledge, and it's probably, look in chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as do the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, all right? The understanding is that Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, was buried, and rose again the third day. How do I know? Go back to Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. <clears throat> the people that Paul is writing to in the Ephesian letter are in verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. And I, I, I just got to say all this. Maybe I'll, I'll try to get over it, but don't fail. The love of the saints here by the Ephesians, these are people that Paul had never seen or met. He heard of their faith. They had a love unto the saints. Hold your finger here, go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for yourself are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is uh, Thessalonica, Corinth, in that area. And the love, <clears throat> the brotherly love there in the Thessalonian letter is about the brethren, the love unto all the saints in Ephesians chapter 1 is based on the fact um, that before they even really kind of had this knowledge of the Ephesian letter, and there's a lot of knowledge in here that they needed. They might not have known they were sealed. I mean, it's something you don't feel. And like I said, you, you may have trusted the Lord years ago and you didn't know you were sealed until somebody taught you this by teaching you, considering what Paul said. And I never knew anything about a seal when I, before I was saved, obviously, as a Baptist. All I thought baptism was the, the account or whatever that sealed the deal. But it has nothing to do with that. 
because those in Acts 2 are not sealed. They have the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost could get them. Uh, first John, obviously, a man sin a sin which is unto death. He's he's not Hebrews 6, fall away, can't renew. I mean, you just go on and on. They're not sealed. But we are sealed, and we don't know that unless we're taught and, and we read the scriptures on it and understand it. And that's why we try to teach you the <clears throat> the pattern of your salvation, Paul, how that he himself is sealed, uh, according to 2 Corinthians 1, 20, 22, I believe it is, which are sealed, he is sealed. So if Paul's sealed, and we believe the same thing Paul believes, the gospel of Christ, we're sealed. But not only do we know that, we can read it. Uh, look at verse 13, Ephesians 1, 13 again. In whom you also trust after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. So the seal is sure because now it's written. And that's one of the, the that's part of the knowledge given to Paul to give to these Ephesians who he's heard of their faith. So these are not the Ephesians he knew in Acts 19 and the elders included. These are people that he heard while he was in prison. Somebody came and told him, hey, the Ephesians are being converted who didn't know you. And they love the saints. They're kind and giving and helping and so forth and so on, because that's what he says in verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. It's like a person gets saved when I trust the Lord. He wants to be around brethren. He wants to be around people of like faith. Because there is a companionship, a camaraderie, a desire to be around people of like mind. You can't be around people very long that don't trust the Lord because you really don't have a conversation. But people that trust the Lord, you want to converse with them. Uh, it amazes me as our Zoom grows how that people want to dial in and listen to the word of God. Well, that's, that's that love of believers that want to share their understanding, listen to things that the understanding come about. And remember, Ephesians chapter 4, again, let's read this, verse 18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. Well, the blindness of the heart is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Their heart hadn't been turned, but their heart will never turn unless they're preached to. And the prophecy never said that God would send anybody to these Gentiles who were far off. Look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off into them that were nigh. So the nigh were the ones that first trusted Christ. They got the gospel, but those that were far off, nobody really knew about them being able to get it. But when they started getting it, then Paul revealed to them why they got it. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith in that, not yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'm sure that the letter was so dear to the Ephesians that believe because it really, it seals the deal, obviously, not trying to be pun, but it seals the deal for them. Yes, we are the children of God. Uh, Ephesians 1, look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And again, I would challenge you in three chapters um, maybe just go all the way through the Ephesian letter and look at all the you, us, we, the difference in pronouns in the context. Uh, chapter two is really clear on this. And you learn in Ephesians 1, 12, the difference between we and you in verse 13. He's uh, pointing out we being Paul, Paul being in me first, first Timothy, and those that 
he missionary journeyed around and saw and they trusted the Lord by hearing the gospel of Christ because he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You look in first Corinthians where I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, the word our, he died for our sins, according to scripture, was buried and rose again the third day. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the gospel world had blinded the minds of them, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. But when you get to the Timothy letter, which is pastoral, where Timothy's supposed to consider what Paul says, you'll find that <clears throat> he would have all men to be saved. Now, the God's world didn't know that because he thought it had to come through people that feared God, uh, according to Acts uh, 13, a separation of Paul, said, you men, of, you stock of Abraham and you that fear God. Fearing God because they were seeing signs and wonders didn't require them. They saw them and it gave them fear. Uh, if you go back in the Old Testament and read in Egypt, uh, there was Gentiles that feared God because they saw what God did to the Egyptians. And even though they were Egyptians, they went out with Israel because they were afraid. And that's like a covenant blessing. But the Gentiles that Paul goes to are one that fear God, according to Acts. And this salvation was sent to them. And Paul is separated from Peter and the apostles because he's not going to lay on another man's foundation. Uh, he said, I never laid on another man's foundation. And the gospel which he preached unto the heathen, Peter didn't know it. And of course, Galatians chapter two, he went up 14 years later and revealed unto him that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. And Peter conferred, uh, he absolutely agreed, you go to the uncircumcision and we'll go to the circumcision, not with the same gospel, but with the gospels they were taught. Peter was taught, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That was the good news to the circumcision. They had killed the Messiah, but they could repent. The good news to the Gentiles, the heathen, the uncircumcision was Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day. It was good news to the Jews that were elect according to grace. Romans chapter 11, verse 5, 6, and 7, very clear. You have to read the scripture. You have to look at the scripture, and you have to let the scripture talk to you to understand how God's working this thing out. And it don't matter come hell or high water, it'll work out because God's working it. But the Ephesian letter, uh, look with me in verse 1, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So there was two groups of people at Ephesus that Paul says. And what did he say? He said the saints, which were at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, who were also in Ephesus. Why? Because it's written to the Ephesian letter, and it's written to the verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. So, at one time, the saints at Ephesus would be at enmity with the unbelieving Ephesians. But all of a sudden, the conversion begins. And there's, there are people at Ephesus that were far off, were being made nigh by the blood of Christ, which is the cross. Look with me in chapter 2, verse 16, that he might reconcile both. I mean, when you come up with the words both, obviously the religious world and some people that come out of religion get into grace at first, they want to make this between Jew and Gentile. It ain't. <clears throat> it's between the first believers and then those that have trusted Christ and Paul's in prison. You see in this, when he did his missionary journeys, there was Jews and Gentiles got to hear the message. Man, all you got to do is go to Acts and read that. Matter of fact, go to Acts 13 with me. In Acts 13. The, being around the synagogue and things like that was opened up by the Lord, by Peter, for his message. But it was paving the way for Gentiles 
during the book of Acts to be able to hear the message of Paul. And nobody knew about that. Nobody knew that Paul was coming. Nobody knew that Paul would be the apostle of Gentiles. Nobody knew that Paul would go to the elect Jews of Romans 11. They didn't know that. Only God knew. So you go to Acts 13 and look with me in verse uh, 37, be it not, well, no, I apologize. Verse 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham and whosoever among you feareth God to you is the word of this salvation sent. I can't go any farther unless I believe the verse. The verse said the salvation that Paul has was sent to those that fear God. That's what it says. So we have Gentiles that fear God. Okay. I cannot read in Ephesians chapter one that I feared God. I heard the gospel of my salvation. I didn't fear God. I heard the gospel of my salvation. You don't have to be fearing God the day you hear the gospel of your salvation. But you believe in God. Some people believe in God and don't fear God. You know that, and no fear of God is before their eyes. Uh, they just believe God exists. He's the creator. Uh, they have this uh, uneven, I don't know how to say the word. Uh, they have, a, it's like lukewarm opinion of God. I mean, like in Revelation, it's just God exists. Yes, God's a creator. God this, God that. But they don't fear him but they don't have to fear him to trust him because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And whether people believe that or not, it don't matter. It's what it says. There's a power involved in the gospel of Christ that you and I can't explain, but it can be preached and it can affect people's lives. Because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. God's power to save people is in the gospel of Christ. What is it? Christ died for our sins. Now, you can believe in God, know you're a sinner. And, of course, religion is always telling you that Christ is the savior of the world and that he died for our sins. And, and they'll tell you now, uh, believe that, uh, that he paid for your sins and all that. Then they'll tell you. You got to say that you're a sinner. You got to tell him you're a sinner. Now that's contradicting everything. That's the perversion of Galatians chapter one. They pervert the gospel of Christ. Preachers are not, they're, they're, they can't, they just cannot get in their mind that the gospel of Christ will save people. Not how they deliver it or what condition is going on when they deliver it. Uh, the Ephesians in chapter one, they heard the gospel of their salvation. They trusted it. And after they believed it, they were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. I don't know what condition they were in. I don't know whether they were uh, around a synagogue finally, or whether they are at home and somebody come by or somebody saw them on the street. I mean, it doesn't really say. But there's one thing I know. They heard the gospel of their salvation. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed and how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? In Acts chapter 13, this salvation that's sent here is for those that fear God. Now look in verse 37. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption, be it known Unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things which could not be justified by the law of Moses. And it is quite obvious if any Gentile at that time in Acts was to come by the door being opened up by Cornelius, and Cornelius has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Cornelius heard what the Lord wanted him to hear. And what's amazing about Cornelius is that Peter was not to call any man common or unclean. And he says in Acts 10, now watch what he says to Cornelius. In Acts chapter 10, verse 30, uh, 28, 
But he said unto them, you know how it's an unlawful thing for a man that, uh, that is a Jew to keep company or come to one or another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Okay, verse 35. But in every nation, he that feareth him. Okay, sounds like Paul. But wait a minute. And worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So it takes uh, not only a Gentile to fear God, but he has to work righteousness to be accepted. Hold there, go to Ephesians chapter one. In verse six, to the, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We don't have to work righteousness. We don't have to fear God to be accepted unto God. We're accepted in the beloved. Well, we wouldn't know that if we didn't hear that. And so the Ephesian letter, a prison epistle, while Paul's in prison, he's in prison for a reason. Turn to Acts 26. We'll come back to Acts 13 just a second, hopefully. In Acts 26, a vision, another vision given to Paul, not on the road to Damascus, but in the temple. Verse 17, and it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am prison and beaten every synagogue, them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and counseled unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Gentiles. Check verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word. Now, Gentile word has been spoken, been in prophecy. Uh, the, so Simon in Luke talks about he'd be a light on the Gentiles. Isaiah 49, 6, a light on the Gentiles. On and on and on. Gentiles have some promises in the scripture, but it's always through Israel. Israel is fallen in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, during the book of Acts, they're being diminished. In other words, with Peter's ministry, it'll come to a point there won't be any more Jews because they won't believe. When it comes to the end of Acts, there won't be any more Gen uh, Jews that will be considered Jews. In other words, it's, there will be no advantage to being a Jew because as a nation, as a whole, they're cast away and only the power of God will work. There'll be more, no more prophecies. They'll fail. There'll be no more tongues. They shall cease because that's what Jews require. And that's what it is about the Jews. But in Acts 22, when he speaks the word Gentile under this word, and it's a dirty word. It's, it's a word of a nation that has no right to anything associated with Jews. Now you understand, we have no right in Jewish knowledge, to have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then why would the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob send Paul far hence unto the Gentiles? Go to Ephesians and watch. This has a time factor involved. The Ephesians chapter um, 2 Look in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off. This is the relationship of Acts 22, no doubt. This relationship is that, that Paul is being sent as in First Timothy. God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Not just those that fear God. For those that were far off that never feared God, especially they weren't even seeing signs and wonders. They were in a place where Israel's cast away. No advantage, no signs and wonders being given. The God of this world knows that. So he develops lying signs and wonders. 
So take it second Thessalonians, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. First century, the mystery of iniquity based on lying signs and wonders. The continuance of, of prophecy and signs and, and healings and tongues and all the things that are, the God of this world brought them on to blind people from seeing the absolute grace of God. Pentecostals have no, they haven't got a foot to stand on. They're not studying their Bible. They don't see it, but they don't have the understanding. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 4. Their, their hearts are still blinded and they haven't turned. Uh, everybody you know, religiously wise, has some idea in their mind that the law still has some effect on them. No, the law has no effect. And when Paul began his ministry, doing his uh, missionary journeys, he wanted to go to Rome, but he couldn't go to Rome, so he wrote the letter. And in the Roman letter, he says, but now the righteous of God without the law. The God of this world, Satan, knows that. And so he still implies that the law is in effect. Uh, if you look at some of these translations, you'll say, uh, uh, aside from the law, uh, in Romans 3, 21 and 22, uh, not, uh, but now the right of God without the law, it's aside from the law. In other words, the law is involved, but you can trust it. That's perversion of the gospel. Why, Ephesians, very clear, for by grace you are saved through faith and that, and not yourselves to give to God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't boast about works of any form, whether it's working righteousness in Peter or working righteousness of the law. You can't boast on that. There is no way. How could people be unrighteous when in the Old Testament there were righteous people? Because righteousness come from keeping the law. And if you broke the law, you offered up to sacrifice. But if you started working, uh, uh, offering up sacrifice on a continual, regular basis, that's iniquity. Iniquity in 2 Thessalonians is the working of something that's not necessary. Well, that would be keeping the law, saying but not doing. That would be confessing your sins when there is no sins to confess. And on and on. Baptism, all these things are not necessary, but the God of this world is totally behind them. He does not hide water baptism. He does not hide the commandments. He doesn't hide those things. Uh, and he false signs, the lying signs and wonders of the tongues and the prophecy. Prophecies can't affect us. They have nothing to do with us. Prophecies are things that are written down, but we're in something that's called hidden God. Uh, look in Ephesians chapter three. And we find out the minister of, of, of this chapter is Paul, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. It's hid. You know, you go over there in first Peter and there were things that were written in the scripture, but hid that they searched. They didn't understand what the, uh, the suffering of, of Christ meant. What would the suffering of their King mean? They didn't know what that meant, but it was prophesied. It was in the prophecy of uh, Moses and Psalms and, uh, the other, the prophets, whatever. But here's, we got something hid in God and it's unsearchable. You can't, you can't go back in prophecy and find it. So that's why the Ephesian and Colossian letter are so dear. We know that it is a true high calling as in the book of Philippians states, I press towards Mark for the prize of high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's a high calling revelation given to Paul when he's called up and heard unspeakable words, which is unlawful for a man to utter. And why do you use the word unlawful? Because it's involved in the fact that it has nothing to do with Israel. There is no advantage whatsoever being an Israelite to get the message. The power of God will save you just like you will a Gentile or anybody else. But you don't have the advantage of the signs and wonders. You don't have those which Jews require because we're in a dispensation. But now you go back to Ephesians 1 and look at, well, I apologize. I want to go back to Ephesians 3 in verse uh, 10. 
to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose. And that's what we're talking about, the eternal purpose, not just purpose, the eternal purpose in Christ Jesus, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. But when did he do this? Look in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. According, he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. All right, this, this is a council. The council of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one, yet they're three. They canceled, canceled, because we know that in Genesis 1, he said, let us. So that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They canceled, canceled this, talked about it before the foundation world. This is the plan that's laid out. This is why I try to tell you, there is nothing in this world that's messing up the plan of God. Uh, all things work together for good to them, to love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, purposes. If God called you, nothing can mess up the purpose. It's like he told, I, let's, matter of fact, let's look at this. Luke 12. In Luke 12, 12, what kind of God would tell these apostles to do this? Explain to them about the birds and the uh, things that and the things that can't take care of themselves but are taken care of by God. Uh, why would he tell them to do this in Luke 12, 32? Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heaven, heavens that fail not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupt. Sell that you have. Turn to Acts chapter 2. You see, people don't do this today, and yet they claim the Pentecostal spirit. And I mean, they call themselves Pentecostal in Acts chapter two. Why would God tell the, the apostles to do this and then instruct these people by the Holy Ghost to do these? Now watch Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises to you. And to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this, from the untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them, the church, the church which is the twelve apostles, about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the twelve, and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear, listen, fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Why would the Holy Spirit lead them to do that and then just later forget them? Just... Say, I've changed my mind. God didn't change his mind, but the program changed. So he took care of these people with the new program until they basically died out. They didn't get the kingdom they were looking for while they're alive, but they will. They will get what God promises them. We're to understand this. Whatever God promised to whoever he talks to, you will get. God never told you that you had to have signs and wonders. God never told you to get baptized. God never told you you were born again. God never told you that you had to uh, fear God to be accepted with him and work righteousness. He never told you any of that. And he especially didn't tell us that are listening to this program today that we had to do anything, he told us, by grace, you say, through faith. I have to accept 
the grace of God as his work. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not yourself, gift to God, not of works, lest any man should both. God gave me salvation. Pure and simple. I didn't have to fear God. I didn't have to do anything, work righteous. I didn't do anything. I heard it. God never gave me the right to dig it out. God never gave me the right to earn it. It just came to me. It's a gift. And if I want it, it's mine. If I want it, it's a free gift. Now watch, Acts 3, uh, Acts 2 again. He said, they received his word, were baptized, and the same day they added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in apostle doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. That's Mark 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them. That believed, they believed. Well, what did they do? They sold their possessions. Well, if I go over here again to, and if if you observe Paul's first writings, uh, Romans, the Corinthian letters, the Galatian letter, whatever, they were giving monetary base. Well, go back to Second Corinthians nine. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse uh, 2 Corinthians 9 1, as touching the ministering to the saints. It is superfluous for me to write to you, abundantly necessary. For I know that your forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you, to them of Macedonia and Archaea are ready a year ago, and your zeal had provoked many, very many. He, <clears throat> look at verse four. Let's happen if they of Macedonia come unto me and find you unprepared. They, they hadn't took up their offerings. They hadn't took up their shares to feed these saints. You see, God's not going to leave the saints at Jerusalem who have sold out and he knows he's not going to bring the kingdom in. I mean, the Lord is not going to return when they want him to. Thus, if he doesn't return when, when they want him to, they may die out. But until they die out, they're sold out. And they don't have any monetary. So, in God bringing forth the dispensation of the gospel. He takes the people of the Romans, the Corinthians, Galatians, Thessalonians, and they love these saints, these saints at Jerusalem. And they take care of them. That, that's what the context of 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he that dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor and righteous remaineth forever. He that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for the, your food and multiply your seed sown, increase the fruit of your fruits of your righteousness, being rich in everything to all bountifulness, which causes uh, through us thanksgiving to God. Now go back to verse uh, Five. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they should, would go before you, before unto you, to make up beforehand your bounty, wherefore you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loved the cheerful giver. And that was feeding the saints. They were feeding the saints. Well, what happens when the saints are gone? Well, then there's no need of bishops because bishops, the elders at 
Ephesus that Paul did know. He came to meet them and he talked to them about it <clears throat> and go to First Timothy and learn about a bishop. I mean, you got guys going, going around saying they're bishop so-and-so. No, they ain't. First Timothy 3, verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop. No preacher desires the office. They're called. He desires the good work. The bishop must be blameless. The husband of one wife, not. That doesn't have anything to do with divorce. I had a guy fight me here at the church when I first moved here many years ago. Said, I've been divorced, so I didn't have any right to be the preacher here. And he was calling it bishop. It's not a bishop. A pastor is not a bishop. A bishop is a desired office, and no, even that, he is not a novice. Look at verse three. Not given to wine, no striker, greedy of filthy lucre, but patience, not a brawler, not coaches. One that rules well his own house, having his children and subjecting with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? There it is, the church of God. They're feeding the church of God. Not a novice, verse six. All preachers are novices when they begin. This bishop's an elder. So he wants this office. He wants to take care of the saints at Jerusalem. He wants to take care of the money. He wants to oversee the money. And in overseeing the money, he is declared a bishop of this oversight. He oversees the money to take care of these people that have actually done what God told them to do. They sold out. But once you sell out, you ain't got nothing left. And when that runs out, when that communal property runs out, you're done. You don't know what else to do. So in doing this, the bishops would take the bounty from the body of Christ because they're never told to sell out. And by the way, the Gentiles were never told to sell out. So they take up a bounty. And Paul and Barnabas in Acts 12 were delivering a bounty given by the Gentiles, such as Cornelius, working righteousness, you know the terminology. Well, the working righteousness is taking care of the saints. But these are the saints at Jerusalem. Don't get them mixed up with the Ephesian letter. That's not what that's about. The Ephesian letter saints are ones that trusted Christ, the gospel of Christ. They were the first who trusted Christ. So let's don't mix them up. We're not talking about them. We're talking about the saints at Jerusalem who had sold all they had on the message of the circumcision. And so they sold all they had. It's beginning to get a little thin. You've got Cornelius and them. They can give working righteousness. Then comes along Paul and Paul being the first in him first, he begins to see and experiences the giving of these believers who have trusted Christ, who first trusted Christ, they were called saints because of the saints and the representation of the gospel of Christ. And they were giving bounty and the bishops, the elders of Ephesus, which Paul knew, would take the bounty and distribute it as necessary. That was their overseeing. Well, in Ephesians chapter four, there's no bishops given. Why? Because the saints at Jerusalem basically are going to be dead and gone. That ministry did not go away in a sense, never to come again. It was just put on hold by God because of the dispensation of the grace of God, his eternal purpose. And that was going to come in to take care of the body of Christ. And by the way, you go back to 1 Corinthians 9 and you understand the difference between some things. In 1 Corinthians 9, can I live by this? All right. Chapter 9, verse 13, 12. If others be partakers of this power over you and not we rather, nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul could have completely and totally be defended on people given to him. 
but he didn't want to do that because he was the first. He's not laying on another man's foundation. He's not going to let anybody brag on how they made him or made him better, whatever else. So he used his tent making as a work. And he said, verse 13, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of things of the temple and they which <clears throat> wait on the altar or partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I can't explain that to you. I have done it all my preaching days. I have lived of the gospel. When I go somewhere, I live of what people give me. I do not work anywhere else. I can. I can't go and do the things I do and work a steady job. I do have this verse. I can live by this verse. And I do live by this verse. And it works. The bills are paid. The groceries are bought. Anything left is mine. I don't get rich. It's not about getting rich. That would deny 1 Timothy 6. Uh, one day I bought a lot of tickets, but I didn't buy one. I bought two. Now you understand, you don't win on two. So I'm denying the power of it anyway. And I thought about that later. I said, good gosh, you know, you buy two, then you don't believe the one you bought will work. So you're trying to reinforce it. That's like somebody says, well, I trust Christ, but I confess my sins. <laughs> you either trust Christ or you don't, and don't confess your sins, or you don't trust Christ and you're confessing your sins. There's no two parts to it. And the same thing, why buy two lotto tickets? It's like a man playing a roulette, a roulette wheel, betting all his money on different colors. Only one's going to win. The rest of it, you're just giving to the house, just like a lot of gambling and stuff that goes on. So <clears throat> these bishops in 1 Timothy 2, uh, 3 are not novices, and they are individuals overseeing the giving to the saints who are at Jerusalem. But the saints which first trusted Christ are those that Paul preached the gospel to. And the ones that heard later the gospel of their salvation were called faithful. They were faithful. They, they didn't depend on signs and wonders and anything else like the saints did. They saw it and they feared God. I can't go any more than understand this. Turn back to Acts so that we see it again. In Acts chapter uh, 13, when the Lord separated Paul and Barnabas from Peter and them because he wasn't going to lay on another man's foundation. Okay. Acts 13, 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham and who serve among you feareth God. To you is the word of this salvation sent. The salvation is based on the gospel of Christ. That's the forgiveness of Acts 13, 39. Justification without the law. Or law couldn't justify you, but you're justified, which you couldn't be by the things in, in the law. So in 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, that's Jew, uh, Jew Ishmael, Isaac, and whosoever among you feareth God. Where does it say? that I had to fear God to get saved. Go back to Ephesians 1. I mean, I never heard it really presented that way until I began to read, but I see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, 13, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. I could walk up to somebody in Selma and they may not fear God. They may believe in God, but they don't fear him because they just don't have that fear. Like signs and wonders give fear. And you walk up to him and you begin to converse with him and you give him the gospel of Christ. Can it save him? Yes. It is the power of God unto salvation. Turn to 1 Corinthians. That's what preachers don't believe. 
they believe it takes some kind of motivation to save people. No, it don't. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, now that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to Scripture. The Corinthians feared God. They turned from their dumb idols. Something they saw, something they had experienced probably gave them some fear. That is not what Ephesians says. Paul came, he was sent. A vision came to him in uh, Acts, and it said, a man in Macedonia said, come over and help us. They sound like they're scared. So he comes over in Acts 17 to Macedonia, Thessalonica. Then he comes to Corinthians, uh, Corinth in Acts 18. He said, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. They have done something uh, according to, let's see if I can find the chapter I'm looking for. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away in these dumb idols, even as you were led. Okay. So they had turned turn from their idols. Why'd they turn from their idols? Well, could be fear involved. This ain't doing it. This ain't right. Something they've seen, something they've heard. I can't tell you, but they, they have turned from their dumb idols because the word were Gentiles carried away. Uh, you look at Acts 17, when he went to Athens, he preached to these idol-worshiping people in Acts 17 in Athens, superstitious, everything about them. When people are superstitious, they have a lot of fear involved. And he preached to them who God was, the creator of heaven and earth, and on and on. If they believed, they would get the gospel of Christ. Ephesians, though. Let's go back. Ephesians chapter 1. Read it again. Verse 13, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and the praise of his glory. These individuals, somebody may have just come to them and say, I want to tell you the good news. What's that? God has forgiven you. Forgive me of what? Uh, of all the things you've done wrong. Your sins. Well, explain to me sins. Well, sins are things that you do that are not with God. Well, how do you explain to a man that's never heard the law or doesn't know the Ten Commandments sin? Hmm. Strikes, strikes a little kick there, doesn't it? I don't have to preach the law to somebody to get them saved. I have to preach the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, not the preaching of the law, not the conviction. Holy crap, man. When you go back to Romans 10, you see it's a gospel of peace. The peace, though, the problem with the Ephesians is written here to show you something. In Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 11, uh, 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you were sometimes far off. Remember Acts 22, he sent him far off unto the Gentiles. When they heard that word, Gentiles, uh-uh, we ain't going to have that, all right? They die by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. You see, the peace of Romans 5, 1 is different than this peace in the sense being justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath. But Romans 5, 1 said, therefore being justified, we have peace with God. That's who first trusted Christ. They had peace with God because of his justification. What was it? He was delivered for our offense and was raised again for our justification. That's what Paul wrote to the Romans. But here is another peace. And this peace is between the people who first trusted Christ and these 
aliens because, listen, if Ephesians 2, 11, and 12 didn't mean something, why did God write it? The Gentiles in Acts weren't aliens. They feared God. So what am I doing here? In verse 11 and 12, got to mean something about something to, to someone. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you, verse 11 and 12, who were sometimes far off, Acts 22, send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. That's us in this day and age. We have no signs and wonders. We have no prophecy. We don't even have to fear God to get saved. We can hear the gospel of our salvation. Oh, yes, we may believe in God, but we don't fear God. Now, you know that by the way Gentiles live. They're not under the bondage of the law. They're not under the fear of the law. The law brought fear. They're under the fear of religion. You don't quit doing that. God will get you. Get me for what? What's he going to get me for? What did I do? And if you don't quit smoking and drinking, that's not breaking of the law. You know, it really kills preachers if Gentiles ever go and read the law and then understand that what they're preaching to them ain't the Ten Commandments. That's what's amazing. And then they got them confessing the things they broke that weren't in the Ten Commandments to get a relationship with God when you're already accepted in the beloved. You have it right in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, and have access to the Father, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. People confessing things they do like it's their going to lose out a relationship with God. No. So you got verse 11 and 12 that brings together two groups of people, those who first trusted Christ and to you who also trusted after you heard the word. And by the way, the true word in verse 13 is also in whom you also. That's the word you want to get. Verse 14, for he is our peace. Those who first trusted and us, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall petition between us, ordinances. It always comes down to the handwritten ordinances. They were gone. And that's what the Ephesian letter was trying to clear up. The Gentiles in the end of Acts, when Paul's going away, are being pressured with ordinances in the Colossian letter. And I'm going to shut up. Colossians chapter 2 clears it up. In Colossians 2, verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That's the cross. Let no man did, uh, therefore judge you in meat or in drink or respect the holy days, new moons or Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is a Christ. We have no ordinances. We're forgiven all trespasses of the ordinances, according to Colossians 2, verse 13. You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You couldn't put the breaking of the ordinances on me. I'd be forgiven of them. I don't have to worry about ordinances. I'm already forgiven of sins. Colossians 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption to his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. How did I know? I heard it. I trusted what I heard, believed it, and was sealed. Did I know I was sealed? No. It had to be shown to me. When it was shown to me, it was the greatest day of my life. I appreciate you listening. Jimmy and Jan, I know, got to go. So we'll probably continue with this later on. Thank you, Jerry.